Today's guest is Antonia Bogdanovich, daughter of film legends Peter Bogdanovich and the late Polly Platt. Antonia makes her film directorial debut with My Left Hand Man. And let's talk about My Left Hand yeah, Man. It follows the theatrical and dysfunctional Emerson family with two teenage sons and an addicted father, a has-been thespian. Of the two brothers, one performs Shakespeare for trusting strangers, while the other picks the crowd's pockets. We are honored to welcome to Film Courage, Antonia Bogdanovich. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's yeah, awesome. Absolutely. And we'd also like to thank Cynthia Stefanoni for helping us arrange this conversation. Love, she wrote an email and and for everyone listening, you guys, you can get a closer look at Antonia's work uh, by visiting station8films.com. And she's on Twitter. You can connect with her yeah. at Tonya2000. Uh, not a lot of guests on this show have grown up on movie sets. Can you tell us about your childhood? Yes. Um, um, well, I think I, my mother probably was pregnant on Target's. Um, no, she walks by with me in her arms in Targets, so you can see a little clip of me. So that's the first time I was on the movie set. I was probably maybe a week or two old. I and um, I really probably didn't understand what a movie set was. It was just where my parents worked. Um, when I first started realizing what kind of maybe that I was a little different, I was about six and a half, and I was driving on Sunset Boulevard with my mother, and I looked up, and there was a billboard of Barbara Streisand <clears throat> and I said mom what's Barbara doing up there <laughs> so I mean I had no idea and she explained she's and it was there was a big gold record next to it and she said well honey Barbara's a singer you know she's not only an actress but she sings and she's she's a huge singer and I was like oh and then of course a few years later I realized like okay you know so that's that's a little bit of like you just don't realize that you're any different from anybody else because this is just what you know. Hmm. So the people that you grew up around, you just knew them as who they were and didn't really realize what an impact they had on the world. Yeah, and you know, the paparazzi, I mean, it's changed a bit. So if we were somewhere with a celebrity, I mean, not, nobody ever came up to us. And, you know, and it was a lot of time spent in homes. So I didn't really, we didn't really go out to restaurants that much. I mean, I went with my parents hmm. separately. Uh, you know, I know there was a little bit of stalking that went on with Sybil Shepherd a bit in Bel Air, but that was kind of, you know, it just wasn't the same when sure. I was younger. So, Well, you've mentioned also in a few interviews that you were rebellious as a teenager. <laughs> Not that I would know anything about That's that. That's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> That's what an understatement. <laughs> what did you do to defy adults? I'm, I'm curious. Well, I, I definitely was, I think, ashamed um, of my wealth okay. somehow. I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. um, by the time I was a teenager, I was quite angry at my parents for not being around a lot and um, making movies um, and, you know, neglecting to be there. Sure. Um, so I, I gravitated towards kids that were all blue collar and, um, and then were thieves. So I think I didn't necessarily know that they were thieves, but it kind of just, it was cool. You know, oh, they rob houses. That's cool. It was only until my own house was robbed that I realized maybe I was, you know, choosing the wrong friends. Um, but I, you know, I, I was kind of a street kid. I didn't really like, you know, I liked Venice. I liked the beach. I, I spent a lot of time outside. So mm -hmm. I, and I, I think I related to kids that weren't privileged, not that the privileged kids had it easier. Um, my friends I could relate to more because they had dysfunctional homes or, you know, trouble in the home or drugs or whatever. And, you know, I had a lot of that. So I just related to those kids easier. Sure. sure. How is being a girl rebel different from being a guy rebel? I'm, I'm sure it's much more controversial maybe because you scare people. They don't know how to sort of categorize you. Yeah. Well, I think with a girl rebel, you have to actually be willing <laughs> to fight if somebody punches you and I definitely didn't have a problem. I mean, I that's wow. the only that's the only oh thing goodness. that comes to mind. Like I got in fist fights in, in in junior high school for sure. And I was never the one that started them, but if somebody punched me in the face, oh, watch out or punch, or tried to hit me or pull my hair or whatever, it was down. I mean, I I got suspended for for fighting. Um being a girl, I'm 
I think that I had certain girlfriends that could handle me, and then I had a lot of guy friends. I think that's what happens when you're a girl rebel, is you have more male friends. Hence, my fr- my short is all male, and a lot of my characters and my scripts, there's great female characters, but it, I tend to gravitate towards male mm. characters and male themes. And bro- I had sisters, so the brother thing was easy to do. Not easy, but um, I love the idea of brothers because maybe because i didn't have i wasn't a boy and i didn't have a brother like so and it's similar to sisters but very different mm. you know yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering during your upbringing were your parents you know them both being artistic were, were they supportive of your um sort of artistic abilities and, and creativity um, my father was absolutely supportive, a hundred percent. I was. I started as a singer. I mean, that was the first thing I can remember that I was good at. Um, and my father was very supportive of me being a singer or a musician. My mother, um, she wasn't supportive in, so much in the arts when I was really young because I think she was trying to protect me from rejection mm-hmm. and um, what she would call failure. Um, so she was very discouraging for me to be an actress, a performer, a dancer. And I think some of that probably had to do with what happened to her and Peter. And it was an actress that split them up. But I didn't really understand that as a child. So I just figured she was right. Okay, you know, you're never going to make it. She'd say a lot of that. And that's hard because I think when you come from an, a, another area that's not Hollywood, like the Midwest or even, you know, um, East Coast, Um, outside of New York City, you know, moms and dads, if they see that their child is talented in one area, they go, oh, you know, go out to Hollywood, become an actress, you can do it, you know, and my mom had the reality of, there's hundreds of actors out here every year, thousands come, you know, she'd always say to me, 1% of SAG works, Mm -hmm. you know, and that sticks in your head, you know. Did that make you want to go after it that much more? Um, Initially, yes. And then it caused a lot of insecurities because you got to be really confident in auditions. And I think another problem I had was, and my mom was actually trying to teach me this, don't be a people pleaser. Don't kick, kiss ass. I mean, she was not like that. Um, and so I would go into auditions and try and please, and that's really the wrong thing to do in an audition. And I think I learned eventually to do it differently, and then I started getting callbacks. You know, don't try and please. Just go and do your thing, you know. Just so in being yourself, as, as trite as that sounds, but just yeah. is that the sort of the rule and that casting directors can see through that, that yeah. you're just trying to yeah. be too eager? Interesting. You know, th- there's always this perception that, that second generation always has it easier. Um, and, and you've said that, you know, just because my parents are who they are, that didn't help me. I had to start from scratch. I didn't have a manager. I didn't have an agent. I was using my personal contacts from my previous work in productions to get people to read my scripts. So, you know, it sounds like you've had it just as hard as anyone listening. Actually, I think it's crazy. Um, I've had it harder. I would say that for sure. Because people are going to not measure me by an anonymous name. They're going to look at at my scripts or me, and then they're going to have a certain idea. I don't know what those ideas are because I'm... I can't look get outside of myself. I don't know what it's like not to be Peter or Polly's daughter. Um, but it's it's interesting because I met um, a, a, a great writer and um, a, hope to be a wonderful friend, Gordon Hoffman. He's Philip Seymour Hoffman's um, brother. Mm. And I didn't know when I met him. Um, I just didn't put two and two together. And when I found out, we of course had more to talk about. And he said, you know, people always think we have it easier but we don't we have it harder and it was so interesting to hear him say that um and then sometimes people don't want to help you because they have a history with peter or polly and they figure you know she's going to be a pain or she's not or who knows you know there's there's a history there um i think the public will if you do something good embrace you more and say well of course Mm -hmm. you know and that's really who we want is the audience to to, to be fans of your work. That's the whole point. That's something my mother taught me. You know, it's all about the audience and the fans. You know, uh, mm. you know that's what you're making the movies for, is to express yourself, to not to Hollywood. I mean, that's great. But your peers, yeah, you want that support. But really, we're trying to reach the general public mm. and, and, and express ourselves artistically. So, um, yeah, I think in Hollywood, it's, it's harder. 
Mm -hmm. It's harder. Well, you seem to have such an old soul, despite being young in physical age. What has been your best um, education and why? Is it is it college? Is it being on the set? Is it just observing people? Oh, um, I, well, my grandparents were probably um, the biggest influence when I was really young. Um, my grandfather was a painter, my father's father, and my grandmother was uh, made the frames for him and also... Um, was just a wonderful European um, human being, just European roots, but just a wonderful human being. Um, Jewish, she was Jewish on, on, on uh, in, you know, culturally, not religiously. Um, sorry, I lost my point. Um, oh, what was my influence? So sure. she passed away when I was in fifth grade. And um, I was very close with her. She was definitely a, a strong maternal figure. So that affected me quite a bit. Um, I think my parents splitting up when I was three affected me very, very deeply. And I'm still trying to come to terms with it. Um, they were inseparable until they made the last picture show. And, um, and they continued to work together even after they split up. But um, if you look at pictures when I was little, I was very attached to both of them. And so I think... I was, a, you know, it made me grow up really quickly to have to deal with, the, like, such a different reality so young. Uh, my parents splitting up. And, um, like, just a series of events before I was 12. Um, and then, you know, my father was a huge director in the 70s. And um, a lot like Tato and O'Neill, we saw a lot of things that children aren't supposed to see. Um um, she's publicly talked about it. Sure. So, um, you know, there was, it was the, that, that culture back then, sex and drugs. And my father never got dipped into, dr I mean, he never had a problem with drugs, but there was drugs in the house. There was, dr you know, there was things going on that were just fun. It was fun. It wasn't like bad, but, sure. you know, oh, yeah. and I don't think you're supposed to, my mom didn't like that at all, that, that, you know, that was around. But I, I'm happy that it happened because it made me the person I am today. I thought it was cool, you know. Yeah. You know, you, you know, your whole life you've been so close to this business. You, I mean, you've seen people um, rise to success; those who haven't risen to, you know, those who have sort of fallen. Um, you know, what what does it take to succeed? You know, uh, in this business. Oh, wow, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, you know, I think that you. I think the thing I've seen a lot is you have to continue to live in the real world and that's really hard when you get successful but if you have even a place outside of Los Angeles where you can go and just mix among the, the populist um, so you you kind of know what's going on like the pulse of the nation but I also think you have to work from a place of, you know inside as an artist and, and express yourself but um, I think you know, it, it go, I mean, it, it depends on how, what you define success as, box office success or just success as, oh, I made a film that I'm really proud of. Um, I think, um, you know, as long as you stay true to your vision of what you started out as a filmmaker, sometimes that's hard, though, because there's, you know, the, 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 the bigger you get, the more difficult it is to actually make those artistic decisions by yourself. So... Um, you know, as long as you're staying true to your vision, and I think if you have a great script to start out with and it's solid script that you believe in, I think that helps. That's interesting. So, uh, so in order to have sort of this balance and maintain in this industry, you're saying that maybe there's a place that someone should go where they're just anonymous, where people don't need anything from them, and they can just kind of be among the people and... Yeah, I mean, I think mm -hmm. Wes Anderson has really done this amazingly well. I mean, he are all his movies, you feel like those are real people, you know, like mm -hmm. these are, uh, and and um, you know, he. I don't think he lives in Los Angeles. Um, I think he spends a lot of time in Paris. Um, yeah, I mean, because movies ultimately are about the human condition, right? Even even us, you know, all the great movies that are science fiction or, or horror, they're they're still about people. You know, it's when you stop really making it about people that you go, oh, this doesn't really ring true to me. So if you are not friends with people that are outside the film business or you don't, you know, congregate with them, how are you supposed to know 
I don't know. You have to just keep keep meeting people and getting to know different mm-hmm. different characters. And in terms too of sort of preserving one's mental health, do you think that's important as well? Because you can go, and it's not about competition, and it's not about anybody's ego, and you can just go and just be kind of thing. Yeah, and mm-hmm. ego is the thing that really destroys people in this business. I mean, I think. I mean, if you if you can't step outside your ego and say this isn't any good, I need to change it. I need to edit it. I need to rewrite it. I need to recut it. I mean, that's that's gonna that's the hardest thing with with being a celebrity or su- hugely successful is the ego gets. I mean, it's it's very complicated. I, mean, I can't really comment because I haven't been there, but um, not truly comment. Um, but to yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to be able to judge, be objective. Hmm. Well, in another interview that you did, you mentioned uh, Lady Macbeth, and you said something fascinating. And you said, it's the classic struggle all powerful women face. Sometimes we have to act like men and repress our female side to get what we want or gain power. But then after we have that power and get what we want, we often suffer because we are women and we feel sort of this intense maybe guilt or we reflect on what we've done and then we feel badly. So how is this struggle both uh, for powerful women in front of the camera and behind sort of different? As far as I can only comment really on being behind the camera now because that's where I'm at in my life. I'm, I'm sure it's, I, I mean, we have to deal with a lot more sexual innuendos all the time as a female. Um, and you kind of have to get past that sometimes to with certain people for them to take you seriously. Or you have to kind of play with that, dance with that sure. for people to take you seriously um, or to actually listen what you have to say as opposed to the flirtation. Um, but I do think we as women filmmakers have to be strong, producers, writers, directors, actresses, because um, it, it's we have to be strong because we have that to contend with. Because ultimately I still think we're a minority as women in the world. I mean, as females, we don't rule, you know, we don't rule all the countries and I think it's, so yeah, I think that we have to, and then we do feel guilty sometimes and we, uh, oftentimes if we have children, we have to leave them at home, which I'm struggling with now, Mm -hmm. um, to, you know, to have a career. It reminds me of the notorious Betty Page with Gretchen Maul and him, here her sexuality gets her foot in the door, but then it's also the thing that kind of holds her back. I always found that fascinating. So how can women work around that? How can we be powerful and in charge without getting the B word slapped on us? Or maybe we <laughs> want that. You know, sometimes I feel like, yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question because sometimes I'll be having a conversation with a man and I'll want to say something really honest, which would be probably construed as bitchy. Sure. And I don't. And then I walk away and I'm like, you know, remember what your mother taught you? Don't be a kiss ass. And it's not that that I'm kissing somebody's butt, um, but I'm not really being honest, like, with them. And that's hard sometimes, you know, to to have to, you know, I think you learn as you get, especially when you're working on a film and you're collaborating, it's a little different than pounding the pavement. I mean, I hope to get to that place where I'm actually just working with people in pre-production, in development, in production, and it's we're working the the building up to that, and and and, and selling yourself and doing all that stuff. It, there has to be a dance that you play to get in the room, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. You know, hopefully your scripts and your projects speak for themselves, but you still have to do the dance. Interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, Antonia. You know, you've had so much exposure um, to well-known people, to to, to famous people. Um, actors, filmmakers, you know, from, from you know, you know, not everyone has that sort of exposure to to, to the people that you've had exposure to. Um, would you say at the heart of it? I mean, uh, I mean, how much of it at the heart of it is them seeking fame? Um, you know, because you know, you mentioned sort of the ego coming to play. How much of it is them seeking fame, and how much of it is is them just staying focused on the work and going after work? Is there some sort of line there? Is there? Anything you can just, I don't know, just enlighten? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that the the actors and um, at, 
when I was younger, we didn't call them celebrities, but actors, well-known actors. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that my parents tended to work with, and I don't think this was accidental, were definitely major artists, um, all of them. Um, and I think, you know, I was an actress, and so I can say this. I mean, actors... And, and, I, and I am still this way, we're, we're filled with insecurities. So um, to a certain extent, fame makes you, I t temporarily takes that away. But I think sometimes it makes you more insecure. I mean, you, I, I'm not sure. I just know that, um, you know, we like to be praised. If we're artists, we like to be praised. But, you know, there has to be something inside that's filling the void besides being praised for your art. You have to have, you have to feel like you're doing the art for yourself. Um, so, I, most of the actors like John Ritter and Jack Nicholson and uh, Shirley MacLaine, the ones that I remember really spending a lot of time with and actually working in production with them, you know, as a production assistant, were quite, uh, you know, they were great. Um, they had interesting stories to tell. Um, I didn't really see so much how the fame had affected them, but I again, I was like an isolated environment, a set is so enclosed and and like it's like a family. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really see them out and about. I know that a lot of those times, if I was with a celebrity on the street and somebody would come and ask for an autograph, they were gracious, very gracious about it. You know, my father included. You know, there are those of us who only see ourselves as actors or filmmakers or screenwriters, and we cannot see ourselves doing anything else. Um, you know, but if for some reason that time comes where we have to walk away from this career, you know, what thoughts or lessons can you share with us, um, you know, whether they be spiritual or, or just simply lessons you've learned in your life? Well, I walked away from this career um, as an actress, and I swore I'd never come back. Um, my heart was broken at the time. Um, I probably was going through a midlife crisis, although I was kind of young, um, in my 20s. Um, I, I started hating the business for everything that it wasn't, and I know that sounds kind of strange, for everything that wasn't the movie set and making a movie, because that's a beautiful thing. It can be, and I've worked on some movies that are, like, disastrously hard, but it it's the, it was the you know the the political part about being an actress and not getting parts be f for certain looks and certain you know uh physical traits um so and then kind of seeing what happened to my father his ups and downs and what happened to my mother she was very successful but she had a tortured personal life um i was like i don't want to end up like that so um, when you do walk away, you have to have something else that you are passionate about or you're thinking about something else. You have to have something to lob on to. Um, but then sometimes it's, it's a period of time, like I needed to take the time to, to develop as a writer in another genre, completely journalist, um, to realize that this is really my calling. Mm -hmm. and, that I, and I fought it hard. I fought against it. So my case is a little differently. But I think you have to have something else if you're going to walk away. Because this is so exciting. You know, but by the time I left, it wasn't that long. But I had been working in film for so long that it felt like a very long time. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to say, I don't need that adrenaline rush. I don't, you know. But I've realized now that there is nothing as fulfilling and interesting as making films. And I never thought I'd say that again. I remember watching an interview with Burt Reynolds, just real quick, doing uh, research for this, and he talked about something fascinating called the enemy effect, I believe. Maybe I'm not paraphrasing it right, but your dad was interviewing him, and, and Burt was saying that there's something in this town where if you rise too fast without paying your dues, there's almost this jealousy that occurs within the industry and almost tries collectively to hold you back. Do you think that still exists today? That was an old interview. Now with YouTube, with social media, and people being able to take things in their own hands, do you think that it's almost the flip side? You know, American Idol can sort of launch someone overnight, or do you think that still exists, that whole sort of, if I'm saying that correctly, the enemy barrier? The enemy, enemy, the enemy factor, very interesting, Bert yeah. said that. Yeah. It definitely happened to my father. Um, 
at least that's what he told me, mm-hmm. you know, growing up. By the time, you know, 1980, 1981 came around, you know, he'd seen his star was falling at that time. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that, yeah, people get jealous. I think it's very competitive. Um, I've never been really a jealous person, but I can understand it. I'm more competitive with myself. But, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's hard for some people. Maybe they want to keep you down. Or maybe they're intimidated by your brilliance, your genius. I mean, mm-hmm. not mine. I'm talking about my father's. Um, yeah, I mean, I I don't think it's as much anymore. No. 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 I no. think, and I think that's, it's funny you mentioned American Idol. I mean, I, I love that show because the public votes. Like, so that's the, I mean, that's like, the box office doesn't lie you know here you are Th- these are what the people are going to see it's a lot of word of mouth but you know the populace is voting in these these uh, superstar that become superstars you know mm-hmm. like kelly clarkson and um mm-hmm. i mean i love her you know mm-hmm. um to name a few well just going back real quickly to your being an actor i think you had mentioned in another interview that you had stage fright and coming to peace with the terms that you, you just didn't really want to act anymore. Do you remember that epiphany? Do you remember when that happened, when you said, you know what, I think this is it for the acting? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I was a terrible auditioner because y- I didn't grow up auditioning. I grew up on movie sets. So you get, on, get me on a movie set and I'm completely relaxed. I can do my work. I can do the lines. I can, what do you need? I'll deliver it. Um, yeah, but on stage... Um, singing was hard for me because of stage fright. I found out my grandfather had terrible stage fright. He was a concert pianist and he could never perform in front of people. So he hence didn't really achieve, you know, that no. level of. But um, I think it's more recently because I came back as a writer and then I decided I wanted to try directing and I started in the theater. So uh, it's a couple of people said, you know, walk. Well, walk by, you know, when I was shooting the short, walk by the camera, do a Hitchcock. And I said, no, I'll do something else that, you know, eventually develop where, you know, I'm, I'm putting my stamp on it. Maybe it's just going to be the visual and, and, and the, the writing and the acting. But, um, you know, I think it was late, you know, when I, close to the time I quit acting, the auditioning was just a bear for me. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you've known J.J. Abrams for many, many years. Um, you know, you said you've known him, I guess, 25 plus years. What, what, what makes him such a unique talent? You know, could you have ever imagined this sort of career path for him? I mean, did you did you envision this happening? I mean, was there something you saw early on that said, you know what, I, I think, um, you know, just, yeah, you, know, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 you know, did you ever envision this sort of career path for him? My mother did. I'm going to give her that uh, credit. I'll give her lots of credit. But, um Oh, yeah. She was working with him um, on the second floor of the Sydney Poitier building, and I was on the third floor editing a film for a couple of years. I'll do anything. And um, they were on the second floor, and J.J. had a development deal. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of downtime with the editing, and then J.J. was writing his um, a screenplay, which became, um, which was called All Four Years. It became Felicity, eventually. Mm. Um but uh, my mother saw it, and she would talk about him all the time. And then I became very good friends with him, separate from my mother. And we would hang out all the time. And he was, he was quick. He was smart. He was funny, hysterical, but really a unique personality and really driven and very energetic. And my, my mother just kept talking about his talent. So, no, I, I'm actually not surprised. He's a super hard worker and incredibly down-to-earth Um you know, I didn't see him for a long time because I, I moved away and I was out of the business. And when I did see him again, we were having this like banter. And I'm like, you haven't changed a bit. And he's like, either of you. But I was expecting him to be different. I mean, I was like expecting him to be completely different, but he's n- not at all. And and he's been so incredibly supportive um, of m- my work and, um, you know, his, just amazing. I mean, I'm just, it, it still surprises me because I'm expecting that he would be different. He's still that down-to-earth, enthusiastic, you know, just of everybody that he's working with and everybody that he works 
with at Bad Robot. They're incredible. He hosted a screening of my short. I mean, it was, like, amazing. They had, like, you know, appetizers and drinks. I mean, I always felt like it was, like, first-class service. I was, wow. like, wow. I was so honored. I was so honored. We are in studio with filmmaker Antonio Bogdanovich. Her film, Left Hand Man, uh, screens at the Buffalo Niagara Film Festival April 15th at 5 p.m., so anyone in that area, you got to get out and see it. Um, and then also at the Memphis International Film Festival, Film and Music Festival, excuse me, April 19th through the 22nd. Well, let's talk about My Left Hand Man and your directorial film debut because you've directed some stage, right? But yeah, this is so the film? just okay. a few things on the stage. I okay. Wouldn't, I mean, it was amateur too. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to put forth that it was like a big, big production. <laughs> it was, um, you know, in a small, small area in Sacramento with, oh, okay. you know, non, you know, professional actors, which was actually really great hmm, okay. because I had to. You know, so making that leap, making that jump, you know, from from stage. And then you said you resisted this for a long time. Why did you have to make this film? Um, well, I think I made the short to to people started asking me when they'd read my scripts, uh, do you want to be a director? And I always thought the question had to do with my father or my mother. And um, I would say, well, I've thought about it. I've directed some th uh, theater, and I really enjoyed it. And the productions were quite successful, in my opinion. And the actors were very happy. Um, Why are you asking? And they said, because your scripts read like a director wrote them. And I said, really? And I said, what do you mean? Oh, it's all visual. Everything's visual. The stage direction, the this, the that on top of the fact that they liked the script, they commented on that. So I started thinking, hmm. And then, and so then I thought, well, let me see if I like it. So let me write a short. Now that was the hardest thing I've ever had to do because I've never written a short and I've always read, read scripts, written features and watched quite a few movies, quite a few. So. And I, I really haven't watched that many shorts. There's really not a lot of, you know, places you can see a short. So that was hard. And I did it to discover if I liked directing. Because you can't really say if you want to direct film if you haven't done it. Mm -hmm. And I watched my father do it. I watched many, many directors work. But it's different when you're the, you're the you know, actually doing it yourself. Well, you mentioned in a prior interview <coughs> that your obsessive and detailed about your writing I think you said to your parents were as well and and that goes back to that whole ego thing because on the flip side we can have too little ego and be too hard on ourselves does that ever happen to you where you hold yourself back because you're too c critical of, of your writing or no um, ever happen? no mm -hmm. uh, it did it used to happen when I was writing prose um, when I stepped into screenwriting I was like oh okay because I'd been writing in other genres for a long time. And then the script writing came so easily, I was like, oh. I'm not saying I wasn't critical of it, but I knew it was for the first time in my life I knew it was actually good what I was writing. Um, and I learned by reading a lot of books about being a writer, you really shouldn't analyze your work until you have like a solid fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth draft. So I never criticized my first drafts. First drafts are all shit. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> leap, you should leap, hear leap. Dave sometimes. Leap, just, leap. Yeah, I have to just cut him off. He just <laughs> yeah, I mean, first drafts, my father taught me writing. Both my parents, writing is rewriting. I mean, I can't tell you how true that is. I cannot tell you. I did 18 drafts on my first, my second screenplay. My first screenplay I actually wrote when I was 27. I put that aside. Um, and I never did anything with it. But the second screenplay that I was really serious about... Um, 17 drafts, 18 drafts to get it right. And then notes from colleagues, notes from my mother and father, which were amazing. So that's how you get through it instead of just... Criticizing yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And then you get really, you get mm -hmm. feedback from other people. But I knew, look, I know a good, a good film, if you know how to read a screenplay and you can see everything, which is how I write, I see the scene, um, you know it's going to work. I mean, in terms of my editing background, construction came easy to me because of all the editing. So I knew, like, when to stop a scene, which scene to go to next. You know, construction is very important to structure. Mm -hmm. Well, then you mentioned um, in another interview that while you were shooting My Left Hand Man or maybe afterward, that you had this moment where you looked up at the sky and you said, okay, this is it. I was meant to do this. And you talk about that that night or that day. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I... Uh, 
Thomas Sangster is an amazing actor. Yeah. He's like, he like took my breath away. Um, and we were shooting, it was late night, and he did something, some take, uh, a, a take of something that was so, I hadn't even given him much direction, and he like blew it out of the water. And, and I'm not, I don't like to be emotional in front of people. I mean, I think that comes from having a lot of trauma you, in your life. When you're young, you just, you want to get away when you're hurt. So, or crying. So I, I was knew I was going to tear up, and I started to. I'm like, you're, I've been around actors my whole life, and you're, you're amazing. And I walked out, and I looked up at the sky, and I said, you know, I was crying. And I said, thank God I found it now before it was too late that this is, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. I know how to talk to actors. Oh, my God, I relate to them because I was one. Like, it was like, it was like, a million like connections and the synapses in my brain going whoa it's mm -hmm. like i found home H how why was this so difficult to find home when i started here but i didn't start on movie sets where i ended up right and i wasn't a director i was always working for somebody else and i paid my dues i schlepped i got water i got cigarettes i got lunches i mean i did it all um you know i i i you know paid my dues so to be the yeah so I, yeah, I, I was like, wow, I'm glad I found, f discovered it on this short film, mm -hmm. that, that this is what I'm supposed to be. And it was very strong, s strong. And, and how, does that, how does that make you feel today, that, that you've come to this epiphany? Well, it makes me feel happy, very happy, and it keeps me going. Um, the challenge now is going to be, you know, making my first feature, which is hard for anybody. Um, that's you know i'm i'm hopefully going to do another short just to keep going just to keep directing i'm a small one you know maybe two day shoot um so i you know i have to keep using the instrument so i'm writing all the time but that's going to be the real challenge it feels great i have a purpose and um and and i'm going to go for it i have been going for it mm -hmm. i mean is is this literally sort of the first time in your life where you feel like now i finally have a purpose i mean have you felt this previously well i i've always wanted to be a writer i mean i started writing poetry when i was 18 so it was poetry for a long time and then it was um short stories and then it was um prose and journalism so um but, but yeah i mean it feels it, no it's it's probably the first time i felt this way and mm -hmm. it's been going on for since i m the middle of shooting the short i mean i had i was actually wanted to direct about a year before that and i mean you can't just snap your fingers and i actually was frightened to tell my father that i wanted to do what he did um i i knew he would i wasn't sure if he was going to be encouraging although he's always been encouraging it was just so weird to go dad i want to be a director because it's just you know it's intimidating sure to, but he was like when i told him he was like well of course i mean i mean he was like it was like a no-brainer for him mm. you'd be great is what he said I, I don't know why i think he would say something else you know it's not the relationship we've ever had he's always been encouraging but you know i think that people surprise you and that's the wonderful thing about relationships mm. so i i wasn't sure how he was going to react so i didn't until i admitted it to him i really didn't want to admit it to anybody else I mean, a lot of people follow in their parents' footsteps. A lot of, you know, people, a lot of doctors, that you're, their sons and daughters become doctors. I don't know why it was such a... I think it's, 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 it's the whole mysticism and, you know, magic about the film business that made me, like, I don't know, insecurities, I guess. Sure, well, I'm sure there's a lot of pressure, too, you know, just to... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that pressure is, is probably... Be very difficult to deal with. How did you go about securing financing for the film? <laughs> I financed it myself. Okay, it was my it was my pretty much my life savings, <laughs> and um, but it's well worth it. Um, and uh, it definitely went over budget. Okay, um, you know because we have you know it's an action a bit of an action movie, so you got a little bit of special effects and you know cost went up <laughs> so from being on the Daily. set i remember seeing uh roger corman speak at the la film festival and they were talking about how he would just cut things down and and just re remember all the, the i mean i can't remember the specifics but the different tips were there things that 
jogged your memory from being on the set where, no, this is going to take too long, this is going to waste time, and let's just move on? Well, I definitely work quickly. I got that from my dad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I also was lucky enough to have actors that I didn't have to do multiple takes, but we didn't really have time to do really over 10 takes. Um, I think on my next film, if, well, I, I'm not going to finance another short. I mean, the short that I plan on doing is going to be like low budget. Nobody's getting paid. I mean, I paid everybody on this short. I really felt like now, but now I have a group of people I think that would come together just for a day and do something. This was a four day shoot. Mm. Um, you, I mean, we, we tried to make two locations. So there's, yeah, there's a de definitely a few things that I knew I had to do as for in the writing to make it uh, work in the budget. Post-production cost a lot more than I thought. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot mm -hmm. about, you know. Absolutely. And I called in a lot of favors, you know, but we pretty much paid for everything, you, you know, know with discounts. <laughs> <laughs> Karma credits, yeah. Karma credits, yeah. <laughs> And and can you talk specifically, maybe there's some examples that you've learned from your father. You know, you've said that, you know, your father taught you how to talk to actors about where to put the camera and why. Can you speak a little bit about that? Um, what you learned from your father in terms of how he spoke to actors and, and, and what you learned in terms of placing the camera? Well, my father taught me, um, he, you know, I think that it's very personal how you talk to actors. I couldn't ever talk to an actor the way my father does. He has like an amazing gift. Um, but I, I'm going to develop mine for further. But um, he was an actor, so we understand where the the actor is coming from. Um, really, you have to encourage your actors, even if you don't like what they're doing or it's not right for where you're going, because you have a, the vision of the whole film, right? So if you, they do a take and it's really not what you're looking for, you don't you don't discourage it. You say that was great, or you know, always give them support. My dad taught me that, um, and um, he learned that from Stella a lot of of how to talk to actors from Stella Adler, his his work there. Um, as far as where to put the camera, um, I've watched I watched hundreds and hundreds of films before I was ten. Uh, we weren't allowed to watch television at my father's house. We were only allowed to watch movies, and he had a collection of, um, you know, not DVDs, but they were on tape, um, and we could watch those. So you know, as a kid, you want to watch something, you know, TV or something. So we'd put on a movie, and then he had a screening room. So. I learned a lot from Orson Welles and Hitchcock and John Ford and, um, you know, Frank Capra and, and, and Renoir. Um, and then from my own father, yeah, he, the, the camera has to be another, uh, the visual has to be a part of um, telling the story. So where you put that camera in a room or outside a room has to benefit the telling of the story in a visual way um, that's the best way I can put it um, but I think he taught me a lot that I, it would be hard to articulate mm. you know now are you planning to turn my left hand man into a feature or are you also working on another feature um, y y yes mm -hmm. I'm 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 writing a thriller based on my left hand man about counterfeiting it won't be called my left hand man it might be called the Car cardinal comet which is uh, one of the, co the the character we had to create in my left hand man because we weren't allowed to use any um, DC comic characters mm. oh, okay. um, but it's about counterfeiting um, I'm writing that but my first feature I'd love to be a script that I happen to find in my um, in a drawer it was collecting dust it was in a pile of my father's scripts and I got to the bottom of the pile I had heard of all the other scripts you know the titles I knew the last script on the bottom of the pile said um, the title of the script and then it said by Peter Bogdanovich and Polly Platt and I said what what's this and and it you know it, so I opened it up and it, and it starts and uh, the kind it was it, after you know five pages reading five pages I was completely into it and mm -hmm. it was happened to be in the genre that I'm in the direction of where I'm going thrillers crimes um, you know um, it's about World War Two um, the eve of Hitler invading Poland, and it's it's gritty. It's it's amazing story. The characters are amazing. It's of course about four men, um, not of course, but 
again my interest is right. so um i completely blown away by it um and we are developing it now doing um with my managers trying to get it set up wow, wow. and and I t it's a beautiful thing yeah. that they wrote this in uh 1968 that's why we've been wow. updating and polishing the script because it you know it was written a long time ago and they wrote it after they'd done targets it's probably one of the few scripts that uh, they wrote together that was not made into a feature. So it's it's a, it's basically a, a very it's like a Hollywood gem. I mean, really. Wow. That's really it's cool. like a little piece of history mm -hmm. that I found in a drawer. And when was this that you found? In December. It? December. Okay. And I mean, I mm -hmm. called my dad and I was like, you know, I didn't know anything about it. And then my sister saw she she'd read it, oh. and years ago, and she was loved it and um, was very interested in directing it herself. So. Um, so it's uh and my father has told me that he would he's totally supportive in me directing this because he owns the script oh, and wow. he would produce it. it like finding he, a he time capsule yeah he will produce it if if um if, if it all comes together he's willing to do that wow. very cool oh, we love it we love it wow, wow. It's, it's been it's been just wonderful just sitting back and just listening to the richness you know like yeah. to just your history it just there's so much there, Tony. We're just Thank so you. grateful that you would come to the studio and, oh, and share please. everything with us. Oh, please. It's my pleasure. Yeah, this is one. I'm kind of speechless. Just, I mean, <laughs> I was just, I, I really? felt I was transported, yeah, as you were telling Aww. me these stories. And um, yeah, thank you so much That's for this. That's nice. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. It's really, really, really enriching. This. You know, we, we've been speaking with filmmaker Antonia Bogdanovich. For more on Antonia, please visit her website, station8films.com. We mentioned you can follow her on Twitter, Tonya2000. And she, you can find all their credits and everything else on IMDb. And be sure to visit the sites of the Memphis International Film and Music Festival and the Buffalo Niagara Film Festival, where the short My Left Hand Man will be screening in April. Is that right? Yes, both okay. of them are in April, yes. Okay. And yeah. hopefully we'll get into a few more festivals this year, fingers crossed. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. very cool. Yeah. All right, well, thank you again for joining us and look forward to seeing if the Left Hand Man is, uh, or My Left Hand Man has turned into a feature and then also this uh, special project. Thank you. Yeah. So. yeah, and she and she just released the trailer online, so be sure to check oh, that yeah, out as right. well. Uh, you know, I know we posted on Facebook. We'll we'll have it. We'll have it. You know, for those of you who go to our filmcars dot com, we'll have it with the interview, so you'll be able to see the trailer there. Uh, stunning cinematography, yeah. excellent acting. Um, you definitely want to take a closer look. It's beautiful, and that does it for us, folks. Until next Sunday, have a great week. <laughs>